why are male celebrities not all clamoring to date female comedians? That's the I, real question. I agree. <laughs> I think you're so right. Hello and welcome to Love Lives, a podcast from The Independent where I, Olivia Petter, will be speaking to different guests about the loves of their lives. Today, I am so delighted to be joined by the brilliant New York Times best-selling author and writer, Curtis Sittenfeld. She is the author of seven novels, including Prep, American Wife, and Rodham. And her latest novel, Romantic Comedy, was picked for Reese Witherspoon's Book Club. Welcome, Curtis. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming. I just adored Romantic Comedy. I read it so quickly. It was a book that I think I really needed to read at this particular time in my life. (laughs) And it's such a unique story. So can you start us off by talking about what it's about and how this plot kind of came to you and came together? So it's about um, a a writer at a late night sketch comedy show called The Night Owls. And her name is Sally. She's in her late 30s. And she's professionally successful and has been at the show for almost 10 years. She was married and divorced in her early 20s. And she has um, sort of had, you know, situation ships since then, but she, she's not very ambitious romantically. Um, and she writes a sketch making fun of how men from the show kind of date up. And, and you know, these funny but maybe ordinary looking men Um, date female celebrities who are guests on the show who are super beautiful, super famous, super successful household names, but ordinary women writers from the show do not seem to date um, smoking hot male celebrities. And so she, she writes a sketch making fun of this. And then that week, there's a smoking hot male celebrity guest host, and she unexpectedly has chemistry with him. And he is a pop singer named named Noah, who's about her age. He's also in his late 30s. And I know you did a lot of research for this book in order to kind of work out what it's like to work behind the scenes of a show like this. And specifically, I know SNL was obviously a huge inspiration for you. And you read loads of memoirs of previous writers and cast members on the show. What kind of things surprised you in the process of that research about what it is like to actually work on a show like that? Because even reading it, it sounds so much more intense that you can possibly imagine, just even the schedule. You know, one form of research was just like watching the show. And it was it was then that I did notice this real life pattern and thought, someone should write a screenplay for a romantic comedy about this or with this premise. And then a few months passed and I thought, oh, the screenplay should be a novel and the person who writes it should be me. But (laughs) I listened to, you know, there's tons of podcasts of comedians interviewing each other. There's um, Mike Berbiglia's Working It Out. Similarly, um, Mark Marin has the podcast WTF. He's obsessed with SNL. There's also Fly on the Wall that's hosted by two former SNL cast members, David Spade um, and Dana Carvey. And they interview like other cast members, former hosts, etc. There's tons of memoirs. I mean, probably the most famous is Tina Fey's Bossy Pants, but there's many others like Tracy Morgan's I Am the New Black. And there's Colin Jost's husband of Scarlett Johansson, yeah. Colin just, um a very punchable face, which I loved. To create the show that is live on the air on Saturday night, that process starts only the previous Monday. But to kind of break it down really gave me a deeper respect for everyone involved in the show. And not just, I mean, the cast members are the people whose names we know. And there have been so many, you know, like Eddie Murphy, Kristen Wiig, Will Ferrell. But Um, You know, the people whose names we don't know, like the people who make the sets and the makeup artists and the costume designers, like those people are so talented, the the musicians and band, the special effects. And, And a lot of these people, you know, stick around for decades. They're like working in the middle of the night doing this very quick turnaround. And I, I do kind of think, I mean, I think people will say this about the show that in some ways the time pressures, I think, make them really ambitious and really resourceful. And what they pull off is kind of magical. Um, You wrote a piece recently for the Sunday Times about what you learned about the women of SNL, because I think for a long time, you know, they were few and far between. And I think Tina Fey was the first head writer there. 
What kind of things did you discover about the way that it's changed to be a woman working at SNL and like over the years? And how did that impact your approach to writing Sally and her position within the company? Um, I mean, so there always were female writers from the beginning and there always were female cast members. I think from my perspective as a viewer, this, this sort of default sensibility of the show seems more female and more feminist in a way that I feel like I could never have dreamed of when I was watching when I was like 15 years old, where it just it did feel like, you know, there might be men playing women and it, it did not feel like a celebration of womankind. Quinta Brunson was the host recently and there was she was um, there's a sketch. This is just like in the last few weeks where um, she played like a lecherous old man. And then a cast member named Sarah Sherman played another lecherous old man. And they were being very lecherous towards this pretty young cast member named Chloe Feynman. And then the other people in the sketch were Bowen Yang um, and Molly Kearney. So, and Bowen Yang is um, like openly gay and Molly Kearney, I believe, is non-binary. And so like there was something really awesome and, and again, subversive and feminist and I loved it. And there's there are more sketches now that I just think I wouldn't, you know, 20 years ago, I wouldn't have known to like even wish for this because I don't think I would have, like sometimes you, you almost, I mean, I, this seems like such a failure of imagination on my part, but you don't know what's missing and, until it's offered up to you. Now let's talk about the love story at the heart of the book. And can we talk about the power dynamic between them as well? Because I think it's interesting that ostensibly, you know, he's the celebrity, he's the big name, he's the celebrity guest on the show. But what's so interesting about TNO and, and, I, guess, and I guess SNL, how it works is it's a very kind of democratizing experience for the celebrity because it's like suddenly they're having to put themselves in a whole new world. They're having to enter into, you know, a very established room of established comedy writers who are at the top of their game and they're suddenly kind of at the bottom of the food chain. And it's a really interesting reversal of power dynamics. Do you think that is something that kind of leads to creating this romantic connection between the two of them? And because but between the two of them, because then also you obviously have the pandemic, which is another great equalizer. Yeah, yeah, I think that both those things are true. I mean, so they initially, um, Noah has written a draft of a sketch and, and he sort of in the middle of the night seeks out Sally's help editing or revising. And so there, there's, which I think this could be to, to many people, this could sound like nothing could be less romantic than <laughs> sitting side by side in front of a computer, like being like, you don't need that sentence, just cut that. Um, but she's the expert and he's kind of learning from her. And they, I think that, you know, she, she's professionally confident. She's romantically insecure, but it's this moment where her, she's in her professional mode. So she's able to kind of help him and be generous. And how has the process of writing this book and researching SNL and the lives of the cast members affected your own view on fame? Because the book is full of so many interesting insights into that world and not just surrounding Noah, but surrounding the SNL castmates who are, you know, in, in and of themselves like stars. Um, how has that affected your perception of it all? Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think I would almost like to be like, I'm not obsessed with fame and celebrity, but obviously, like, I don't think I'm obsessed with it in the sense of hoping for it for myself, but I think I am kind of obsessed with it in, in our culture because I certainly, you know, keep writing about it. And I think, I think that some of what makes me like, you know, as you said, this is my, my seventh novel. I wrote a story collection, so it's my eighth book. I've, I've certainly been lucky as a writer in terms of like the attention that my own books have gotten. And and I think I myself feel confusion about like how much public attention is desirable, how much is healthy, how much just kind of messes you up. Okay, so my first book, Prep, came out in 2005. And um, in the 18 years since then, the amount of time that a writer is expected to be on a screen has changed greatly. Like in, in, you know, 
2005, you and I would not, there would not have been cameras. Yeah, I would yeah, not have been yeah. wearing the minimal amount of <laughs> makeup that I'm even wearing. I know this is something Sally Rooney has spoken about a lot and she's kind of totally withdrawn from the public eye because it's, it's, it's just very, it's very strange dynamic and it's not at all what we kind of go into it for. But it's like the world we live in now with social media, everyone is almost encouraged to want to be famous and if not famous have a degree of attention on them like I think if you look at studies on Gen Z the top desired job is to be a social media influencer you know it's like yeah. to have those eyes on you yeah and it's just so interesting that that is now something that people are kind of glamorizing and fetishizing when actually the reality of it seems quite unappealing <laughs> oh yeah 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 and I, I think I mean it seems like almost anyone who has gotten a true taste of fame has some degree of ambivalence about it. Or, you know, like, obviously, it's it's very easy to find, you know, documentaries or stories about celebrities who really, you know, were very talented, got recognition and and struggled a lot. I really, really want to ask you about the Danny Horse rule, um, which, you know, you mentioned Colin Jost and Scarlett Johansson. That is the obvious. <laughs> That is the most. That is the most obvious example that comes to my mind of it. But, but people often think the most obvious examples are like Pete Davidson and fill in the oh, you know, well, Ariana Grande. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in the blank. Where, where do you think that comes from? Because obviously there's kind of a conversation around men always punching above their weight, and there was the even the Barbie trailer that came out recently. The tagline was like, "She is everything. He's just Ken," and then that went viral because everyone was saying, "This is so true. This is so relatable. Women are." always so much better than the men that they date which is obviously not true but there is a degree in truth I suppose around that why where does that come from why is this so relatable to so many people do you think so Sally thinks of it as the Danny Horst rule she writes this sketch and then you know the book is sort of about the fact that the the rule is not really a rule at all like it is a pattern um, and and it's sort of like you know it when you see it like I think people recognize it it's a pattern on SNL it's a pattern you know, in Hollywood, like it's it's unusual for a super famous heterosexual male celebrity to be dating or married to someone who doesn't look like a model. No matter what their profession is, yeah. they tend to look like a model. Um, and whereas it's not unusual for a heterosexual female celebrity to be dating or married to a, a man who does not look <laughs> like a model. One of the funniest examples to me that's kind of like maybe the exception that proves the rule is people really freak out about um, Keanu Reeves dates this woman named Alexandra Grant. Yes. And I think people people feel like Keanu Reeves is a gem. He's a lovely person, which I mean, I don't know any more than anyone else. I've certainly heard that. And um, and I think I, as, as far as I can tell, people think it's like heroic that he dates a woman who like doesn't dye her hair, doesn't seem to dye her hair, like has naturally heroic. grayish or yeah. whitish hair. Okay, so, so <laughs> if I'm, I mean, based on what the internet tells me, she like has a PhD, she's a very accomplished artist, she's very attractive. Um, She's very stylish and she's like nine years younger than he is. And, and this is supposed to be the example of like someone dating like a normie. Or so, so it's like, oh man, like, can we really not do any better than than that example that, that proves nothing? Like, I think like, you know, he's lucky to be dating her. I don't so I I don't really know the answer. And and one other thing I should say is that pondering this phenomenon actually. I think in some ways made me come to the opposite conclusion of what the book might seem like, where where I think um, it would be delightful to date Pete Davidson. Like it's like if I if I were a gorgeous, very talented, um, you know, female celebrity, if I were a musician or an actress, like why wouldn't I want to date someone charming and funny? And that maybe actually the surprising part is that that doesn't seem to be true for male celebrities. Why, why are male celebrities not all clamoring to date female comedians? That's the I, real question. I agree. <laughs> I think you're so right. Right, let's move on to the loves of your life. So tell us about your first love, which is your group of writing friends. Um, yeah, well, actually, it's really funny because um, 
one of my writer friends is my friend named Aaron, who ch chose all the clothing that I'm wearing right now, except for my underwear. <laughs> she even, I was, I was telling someone recently, she was even like, you need a new bra, Curtis. So, she, so she's even responsible. But, so, but, but that's not real. I mean, I just think, I think that, um, so I'm very lucky. I live in Minneapolis where there are a lot of writers. And then even I have, you know, writer friendships from grad school from 20 years ago. But I, I think that being a writer does feel somewhat like different in your, in your habits and different in your outlook um, than uh, other jobs. Like I think it can be much more interior and much more isolated. And you, you sort of, especially if you're writing fiction, you care so much about people who don't exist. And so I just feel like being able to talk to friends and, and kind of, you know, like like the sort of practical parts of it and the more abstract parts of it of like, I'm trying to finish a draft of my novel and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to finish by Christmas. And even like saying that out loud to a friend, I think makes it more likely that it'll happen or being like, oh my God, like, like I have a friend, my, my beloved friend, Susanna, where she will sometimes um, text me, like I wrote this many words today. So she'll just send me a text and she'll be like, it'll be like, 1862 or like 450 and I'll send back like party hat emoji or whatever and just like kind of holding each other accountable and knowing how strange it is and I do think writers are more neurotic than than the average person and I think you can be sort of worried like you can you can say I want to write this part but it's like kind of based on a family member and I just need to like think through how I should handle it. And like if I had, if a friend said that to me, I would say like, I think just write it however you want to write it, then like revise it and sort of smooth it out. And then you kind of have like a fork in the road and you could either like ask the person how they feel or run stuff by them. Or you could just be like, okay, now I'm going to pull this all out but replace it with something that will kind of achieve the same thing, but everything else in, is in place. So that'll be easier to do. So it's just like kind of, yeah, like you, you just, you have the same weird frames of reference when, when you're both writers. So tell me about your second love, who is a specific writer that has inspired you. Um, so my, my all time favorite writer since I was a teenager has been, um, Alice Monroe, who is beloved to, to many, but has written, she writes sort of long short stories. She really hasn't written novels and most of them are set in rural Canada. Many of them are set like decades ago. Um, and I just, I feel like she's very, um, she's very honest about human nature, including sort of assuming that everybody has kind of mixed motives or selfishness or, you know, assuming that most of us are not like moral paragons. Um, and then she also is so good at describing things like so precisely, sort of emotional moments or like fleeting feelings that you might think there aren't words for, but she shows you that they are. Um, and and I, I think, you know, she she respects her characters and kind of takes them and their concerns seriously, even though I don't think the outside world would always take them or that, you know, like whether it's because they're from small towns or whether it's because like it's a woman in her 60s or whatever. And just kind of knowing like all of our lives matter to us. And, and I, I just feel like there's so many so many ways that she's smart as a writer that I think I've tried to emulate. And when did you realize that you wanted to be a writer? Was it when you read her work or was it before that? Um, I mean, I, I wrote stories pretty much from the time I learned to read and write, you know, when I was like seven or something like that. I don't, I don't think I, you know, knew that it would be my full-time job or even like my part-time job. So I, I think that I always probably felt like it was my, you know, my hobby and I, and I would always do it. And th I mean, there is something kind of strange when your hobby becomes your profession. You know, there, there are pros and cons. I would say, I think there are more pros. Um, but I, you know, I think when I had my first novel prep was published, 
uh, it was essentially successful enough in the United States that it gave me this kind of foundation of I signed another contract and I, I didn't have to teach part time or write freelance articles or things that I had been doing to actually pay my rent. And, um, you know, that's that's definitely like a huge privilege. And it's not most most people who publish books are not full time writers. Some are. But so so I don't I think it was kind of like a gradual realization that that it was something I could do full time. What is it like having it as your full time job? Because I mean, just I took like a month off my other work to kind of just focus on on writing a novel and just to focus purely on creative work. It sent me a bit mad yeah. <laughs> because it, it's such an indulgent thing to ah. do that it feels like it feels really indulgent. It, like, yeah. like you said, it's weird when your hobby becomes your profession. Like, yeah. how do you rationalize that in your brain, and how do you maintain a modicum of sanity? Yeah, those <laughs> again, are, a selfish question. No, <laughs> those, those are know. those are excellent <laughs> questions that I think at times I have asked myself, yeah. and I mean, there have been times when I thought like this is so self indulgent, and what I mean. I feel really grateful that like, you know, the podcasts that I love exist, the books that I love exist, the television shows that I love exist, like they bring me pleasure and comfort and entertainment and like they're thought provoking and they challenge me. And so I, I do think, okay, someone made those. I mean, so it was someone's job to like make a TV show or to, you know, make a podcast or whatever. And so I'm glad that those exist and and maybe maybe it's like I'm doing that for someone else and including like it could be somebody who has a much more heroic job like somebody who's a social worker or someone you know who's like a doctor or something who just needs to unwind and wants to wants to read about um, a Saturday Night Live writer and and a pop singer having a romance and um, <laughs> that's that's the way that they kind of like decompress. Um, and your final love is an activity that I think is also really fundamental to a lot of writers' processes. Definitely is to mine. Tell me about why you chose this. Um, which is walking, going for a walk. So I like I go for tons of walks. I mean, partly. Like writing is very solitary and very sedentary. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I live in Minneapolis, which is very cold a lot of the year. Um, and so it's like I have all this gear where I, I bundle up and, um, you know, you could you could like pass another human. And like even if you knew each other, you'd both be so bundled up, you'd be unrecognizable, <laughs> I mean, literally. Uh, but I just I, I think that y y it's kind of kind of the way your brain maybe like relaxes a little bit. If you're kind of doing mindless errands, like maybe you're grocery shopping, um, I feel that way, or washing your hair or whatever. I mean, I've literally had ideas for novels while washing my hair, but if you, it, it's like just kind of not trying to think of anything kind of maybe allows you to have more insights. I mean, I wouldn't really say I walk to have insights. I think I just walk to kind of feel like calm or to feel less neurotic. Yeah, and just to get fresh air yeah, as well, because if you're yeah. spending all day inside at your desk. Yeah. I find it so funny when you see these, like, sometimes I see these Instagram videos of like a day of writing and or like just writing at my desk. And it's like, there's a candle, there's some beautiful music, there's like a pretty window. Or like you're going to this glamorous writing retreat. I'm like, that's not what it's like. Yeah. It's like, I'm in yeah. pajamas, I'm like yeah. hunched over my laptop, yeah. like freaking out. Yeah. I'm like, I haven't showered yet, I haven't yeah. washed my face, I haven't seen anyone in three days. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. This no. isn't it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that might be, that sounds much more recognizable <laughs> and, and accurate to me. That is it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. You can listen to Love Lives on all major podcast platforms and you can also watch us on independent TV and all social media platforms and all major connected devices. Thank you.